Chobham in Surrey, heart of the home counties. Down the road to Great Windsor Park, over the hill to Royal... We have these sort of experiences around Barbara, and they've had people who've been speaking in other languages. And they, anyway, it was, it was old hat to them. All Bubba's devotees are eager to tell their own story of his impact on them. And Kathy McCormick was an academic. Now she lectures on Baba's yoga. Something hit me. It was as though a sonic boom had occurred just above my head. And I don't know exactly how to describe it, except that a level of my being was opened that I never knew existed. It was absolutely incredible. Tremendous love, tremendous ecstasy. And this went on for about two weeks. I mean, I was a complete basket case. It was all I could do to put one foot in front of the other. You know, I mean, I'm, I tried to be a very controlled person. I very much just like freaking out in front of other people. So I, it was about two weeks before I could chant without weeping. You know, I mean, it was, it was a terribly, terribly profound experience, and I found that it never leaves. The claims sound extreme. To us, the very idea of a guru is exotic. But to much of the world's population, the belief in living spiritual teachers is a commonplace, and their influence a matter of record. Even politicians have had such a reputation, as did Mahatma Gandhi, or Mayor Baba, the silent master, or the yogi Ramana Marashi, or Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the teacher of transcendental meditation, who recently met Baba in Switzerland and acknowledged that he'd reached the highest possible level of spiritual attainment. Baba himself left home at 15 to search for the direct experience of God. He became a monk and received his religious name, Muktananda, which means bliss of freedom. He met and lived with many of India's holy men and gurus and claims to have mastered many forms of yoga. But in spite of all this, he said that his search only bore fruit when, after 25 years of wandering, he met his own guru, Bhagavan Nityananda, who transmitted the force that awakened him. The force is called Shakti. Muktananda's feeling for his guru seems to be the equivalent of the feeling that a devout Christian has for Christ. The guru is seen as the perfect one, the one who shows in his person the essential divine nature of the whole of the universe. The North Indian town of Ganeshpuri, near Bombay, grew up around Bhagavan Nityananda's ashram. And when Nityananda died, the focus of attention turned to Baba's ashram on a nearby hillside. It grew from a small group of huts to its present scale. A prominent feature in Baba's ashram is the statue and shrine of Nityananda, where reverence is still offered daily. But here there's no doubt that it's Muktananda himself who is lord of all he surveys. The place and its life is seen as an extension of the Guru's inner state. The ashram is a complete environment. It provides work and lodging and is constantly being extended and beautified. Everything is done absolutely in accordance with the precepts of the master, who is provider and administrator as well as teacher. Through surrender to this discipline, the devotees believe that their own inner state comes closer to that of their guru. So the guru's role is twofold. First, to awaken the disciples' spiritual energy, and then to guide them through what may be a long process of maturing until they share the guru's spiritual awareness. This whole process is called Siddha Yoga. Siddha Yoga is an internal process rather than an external technique. Many people are familiar with the different forms of Kundalini Yoga that are practiced under an external teacher. He may have you concentrate on different chakras of the body, different energy centers. Uh, he may give you different breathing exercises to perform, may have you do different hatha yoga postures and so on. But in Siddha Yoga, this all happens spontaneously as the result of the touch of the guru or as a result of receiving the guru's grace, Shaktipat. Uh, you often hear many people immediately begin automatically to do this pranayama. Some people do automatic hatha yoga postures. When it's called for, it occurs. You see, it's, the guru actually transmits his own consciousness into you, you see, and it, it's, it's fully intelligent and continues to function inside you.
come to the focus of the Swami's visit. Two days of intensive spiritual exercises. Everyone has been urged to keep their attention directed within, to meditate on their own inner being, and not to be distracted by what may happen around them, because now is the time at which the most concentrated effect of the Guru's presence may be felt, the awakening of Kundalini by the Guru's touch. After the ceremony, there's a session when the participants share with each other what they experienced in the meditation. I was so heavily 
into the meditation that I had spontaneous silence. When I came out, I didn't feel like talking to anyone at all, but just resting very peacefully, very quietly in my inner self. And that was a very important experience for me, but I tend to talk a lot to people on the <laughs> and to relate to people very much straight like this, looking at them and talking to them. And it was a very beautiful thing for me to be able to just sit in my inner self and watch the kind of relationships which developed with other people all around me while I was sitting in this very peaceful in the place. After a few minutes, this image seemed to come in like a kind of aeroplane at me, you know, from very, very way down. It kind of went like that, flat on my head. <laughs> and it was um, an image of a, it seemed from a very, very, very long time ago, you know. And it was an image of a, of a, of a girl, a little girl. Uh, or it could have been a boy, I thought it might have been my half-brother who died, but I don't think it was anybody really. It was just a little girl sitting on a wall, like as if it had been an old photograph taken. And she was leaning towards the camera like that, looking really, very happy, you know, very, very happy. And I looked at it, and I couldn't stand it, because it was so happy, you know? <laughs> and, um, it was as if uh, all the, all the resentment that I felt that other, other people's having brought through my life um, because of the memory of this very primally happy person, you know. I'm not Australian very well. Anyway, after that, I went into that room and I completely broke down. <laughs> and um, uh, when I recovered, after that, it was, um, I had a very kind of hygienic experience for 12 hours. Um, right and through until the next morning, where uh, the whole world went extremely, um, extremely pretty, not beautiful, pretty, and everything was very precise and pretty, and, and the colours were all pink and yellow and uh, very three-dimensional, and uh, that lasted really until then. The atmosphere is so highly charged that the outsider can't help wondering if this isn't just the triggering off of pent-up emotions, which sometimes trip over into hysteria, and if enlightenment isn't just a form of neurosis. And if it is something else, how is it different from these psychological disorders? We put this question to an educational psychologist from the University of Michigan, who's been associated with Muktananda and watched this effect many times. What is it that makes it different and makes it other, what makes it not, not a hysteria, not a you begin to see that people's lives change in a positive way. And, you be, and that's, that's a little vague, but what I mean by that, and it's vague because I'm talking about a whole group of people at once, but what I mean by that is that <clears throat> in the hysteria, it just goes on and on and on and on, and the person literally starts, uh, their lives start to disintegrate, start, start to crumble. Whereas with this, it doesn't go on and on and on, there's more crumbling and more crumble. What happens is it happens, it's over with, the person understands something for that, and they rise to a new, a higher level. Um, they, become, they get clearer on life. Uh, they feel more connected to their world, not more alienated. You know, when you're talking about psychology and different manifestations, disorders, essentially you're talking about being alienated from the world. And what I see all the time are people getting more and more in touch with their world, being able to move in situations that they never were able to move in before, being able to relate to people that they could never relate to before, uh, being able to just be and live life the way that they could never do it before. So all of those things are the things that, from a psychologist's point of view, makes, you have to say, this is different. I, I spend a lot of time with Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs, but this was slightly different. Um, I've not seen people, a bit like the old Quakers, I think, quaking. And I, I was sort of thinking back in terms of history, what their experiences were. Would you say that there was an enthusiasm which is perhaps lacking in the established church from the this morning? I think this sort of freshness and liberation is, is growing everywhere amongst all religious people as we're we're moving away from doctrine when people said this is what you must believe, this is what you must do. We're moving and we're all probing and seeking, which is a much healthier really. And our 
Perhaps a fresh sense of openness and contact between people of different religious traditions and different spiritual experience is indicated by the fact that the Archbishop of Canterbury sent to welcome Baba his special representative, the Secretary of the Church of England Commission for Interfaith Relations, Canon Peter Schneider. The Canon was offered the significant courtesy of a chair at the same level as the Guru. We do not feel we have all the answers. But it is my experience that as I begin to understand men of other faiths, I understand more of God and even more of my own faith. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. And I hope uh, I would be very grateful um, to hear of to hear from you, uh, Reverend Father what you think we should do to further this understanding uh, in this country as well as abroad. Manusha, jisku badana chata, the thing which man wants to increase or progress, first of all he himself should improve and progress. Then it's very easy to do what he wants to do. The bird a flower should blossom and then the fragrance will spread on its own. You don't have to make an attempt to make the fragrance spread all over. Now I respect all the religions. Now why should they create a war on the name of religion? <laughs> These days mainly it's a very necessary to have universal brotherhood. Mm. I also respect you and I'm very grateful to you because you have taken your time to get here. It's from answers given in interviews and open audiences that the Swami's teachings can be gleaned. Such events are recorded and much has been published. But most of the teaching is for those already initiated into his meditation. How does he describe his work to the outsider? Why do people give their whole lives to him? What is the essence of his message? We had our opportunity to ask. Many thousands of people receive something from your teaching. They have tried to tell me what it is. Will you tell me? I will tell you what I say happiness and love that uh, you are looking outside and putting forth a lot of effort still you're not able to find them so I tell them to look within and meditate a bit and then they'll find those things right within themselves and also I haven't come here with a particular particular special religion and also I don't preach religion just as sleep doesn't belong to any religion, it is your own thing, it's your own property. In the same way, meditation is your own independent thing. But people give the whole of their lives to you. You control the whole of their lives. They have told me so. Many people say that, and maybe they give their lives to me, but the thing is, I have my perfect life with me. I also give my life to them as much as they're able to hold it or take it. Also, this is like, this is the bargain goes on. But are you conscious of directing the activities of your devotees? Directing their lives completely? Yeah. It's not that I keep them with me all the time. You know, I send them to do their own work too. I travel all around people, I, I travel all around the world, if, and so many people meet me, and if I try to keep all of them with me, where I can keep them? If, uh, if 25 come to me, then 25 go away, and you know, after learning something. Some of you can, by a touch or a look, I am told, Awaken a force in people. I say you, Yes, 
उसको सिद्ध योग कुछ को अनुभूति जल्दी पकड़ लेता है श्रद्धा भक्ति से सम पीपल एक्सपीरियंस दिस इमीडिएटली बिकॉज़ ऑफ तुरंत एंड इंस्टेंटली बिकॉज़ ऑफ फेथ एंड डिवोशन और कुछ को देर से मगर वो व्यर्थ जाता नहीं वो अनुभूति आता ही एंड सम पीपल एक्सपीरियंस दिस लेटर बट स्टिल इट डजंट गो टू वेस्ट कुछ को अंतर होने से अनुभूति समझता है सम पीपल डोंट एक्सपीरियंस दिस इमीडिएटली बिकॉज़ it happens in the inner level so say after 3 months or 4 months or 6 months they experience this and then they and then it dawns on them that oh this is the shock that or force that i'm experiencing shall i receive this force having met you oh yeah yes it's likely <laughs> you will it's likely it seems i'm certain we'll take a मिल जाएगा उसका मतलब प्रनिश्चित नहीं मिल जाएगा शब्द निश्चित चे मगर फिर भी ऐसा बोलना पड़ता मिल जाएगा इट इज सर्टेन एंड व्हेन आई से दैट यू वी ऑल बिकॉज़ आई हैव टू से दैट वे यू नो यू मिल यू माइट इट इज सर्टेन बट ही हैज टू से इट इन दैट वे यू माइट यस आई डोंट अंडरस्टैंड दे आर पीपल थिंक ही निश्चित है लेकिन आपको इस तरह बोलना पड़ता है तुम्हें समझ नहीं है एक बोल लेकर वो बात है That's the way I say. That's my nature. I must accept it. It's not easy to tie Baba down to definitions. There's no feeling of deception about him, but neither is there any way in which he can make us understand by explanation. the experiences that people around him undoubtedly have some have been overwhelmed by his touch many have felt the whole meaning of their lives to be changed and to report honestly on baba's teaching it's not enough simply to listen with sympathy to open oneself to what he offers it's important to observe the effect he has on others I like him I don't like his henchman too much why um, the first day i came here the day before yesterday I got really angry by people telling me what to do all the time. I, I tried to get out of there one time. They wouldn't let me out. I just had to force my way out in the end. And the guy came out and gave me a hell of a bollocking about it, like saying, "Can't. What do you think you're doing? You can't get out of there." I think he has what they say he does, which is to light your candle from his candle. And I'm willing to believe that. <laughs> he's my father. He's my mother. is my brother is my friend is my guru <laughs> everything uh, he, he plays all the roles ye guru gyan batai kare man man ko jan jai nanak di there's no doubt that a lot of the emotionalism that surrounds baba has all the trappings of a personality cult his picture hangs garlanded on the wall they even say that by just a, a look at his photograph you can receive shaktipat the instant enlightenment as for myself well i have to admit that so far the guru's touch hasn't produced any sudden upsurge of cosmic awareness but even without that i do accept that he didn't come to england to milk the youth of the privileged middle classes by wrapping them up in saris and eastern mysticism and also i accept that his basic message that god dwells within you look there is important as a meeting ground between those committed to both eastern and western faiths a committed roman catholic who left her position as professor at boston university to work with baba is charity james now are you saying that you hadn't realized that there was something missing from your life but then you discovered there was yes that's very good that's very interesting i've always had a i've always been a, um I, I don't like to say practicing Christian because it's such a difficult thing to practice anything, but I've always been a serious one. I think with good times of atheism mixed up, you know, because I think it always happens if you're serious. Um, and I didn't really think that I needed a living teacher, a living master, as well as uh, as our Lord, who meant a great deal to me and still does. And, and that's really 
why I thought uh, I'd heard about him, and, and I heard, thought, heard the name Muktananda, somebody told me, and I thought, well, if ever I need a guru, which I, thank God I don't, I won't, that would be the one. You know, of course, that was the fatal moment, I think. <laughs> then that, 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 happened. Yes. That, that moment you didn't, you just said I didn't. didn't. I thought no, and I thought, I'm very interested in the idea that um, the East and West must come together, and that uh, the East and Western spirituality, that man is at a stage of a very great spiritual advance, I believe at the end of this century, it's a tremendously important time, and that one of the aspects of this would be a coming together of East and Western spirituality. And I, and I had an idea that I needed to do that in my own life. Clever but you didn't find any conflict here, you were attending Mass regularly, you, you were a serious and thinking yes. Christian, yes. and you accepted that I am the way, the truth and the life, yes. no one comes to the Father but by me, and yet there was something missing in it. Yes, there was something missing. What there was, was that missing, missing quality that I felt? Well, it is the having a living teacher. It is the uh, ability to see in our time, in my life, somebody who has reached transcendence. I do see that Baba is in the state of per eternal bliss, that he, permanent bliss that he, he describes, that he is all-knowing, and uh, everywhere and all-powerful. I mean, I can see that man can, with, who has followed a deeply serious spiritual path, as you know, his was very, very long and very, very hard, that he can become like that, and I can too. And of course, I know it's there in the Bible, but be perfect, you know, even as, it, uh, as your Father in Heaven is perfect. But I didn't really ever think it, that this was something that applied to me. I've noticed that people, when talking about Papa, tend to slip into hyperbole, and you're just doing, doing precisely that. You're saying that he's all-pervading, that he's all-knowing. Now, are you abandoning your intelligence in using these words? Are you using them in a different sense from the way you'd normally use them? Or do you really believe that he is all-knowing? Transcendent. I really believe that he's all-knowing and transcendent. I, I, I experience it in, uh, with so many. He has hundreds of thousands of followers all over the world. Everyone senses themselves in, or herself in complete contact with him. If you ask him a question, if you write him a letter, he knows immediately not only uh, what state of mind you're in, but also all the circumstances. And it's very interesting when he answers a question in the hall, he will give answer that is totally appropriate to the heart of that of the person he's answering. Mm. And uh, yes, I, I believe that he, he is. I think well, we all can be like that. Do you see yourself now as someone striding two cultures and aware of both, or do you see that your own culture, your own Christianity, has been deepened by your contact with Baba? I feel that my own Christianity has been deepened. I don't feel any need now to try any of the others. I know that Baba would deepen the understanding of. Sufis, Buddhists, or Muslims, as he's deep in the mind of my own. So I'm quite satisfied just to, to continue to go to, to church and uh, continue to love our Lord and uh, to continue to come to and to run a centre for Baba and to continue to love him. And not to feel that there's any division there at all. To feel quite united. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 